Valentina's life has been marked by hardships. When she was a young girl, her father tragically lost his life in a war zone, leaving her alone without his support. Her mother, Veronica, struggled to provide for Valentina, but unfortunately fell ill frequently, sometimes being sick for months on end. Eventually, her employer began suggesting that Veronica was dispensable due to her persistent illness. Feeling defeated, Valentina's mother voluntarily resigned from her job. In the midst of her struggles, Valentina witnessed her mother's emotional breakdowns as she locked herself in her room, sobbing into her pillow. Money was always tight for them, often resulting in meals consisting solely of bread dipped in salted sunflower oil or empty pasta. Valentina's lack of resources also manifested in her appearance, as she was consistently the most poorly dressed student in her class. Valentina endured the torment of her classmates, who openly discussed and mocked her shabby clothing. She grew accustomed to the whispers from her peers, even on days when she showed up in a patched sweater, attempting to mend her appearance. Tragically, when Valentina turned 14, her mother passed away, leaving her in the care of her aunt, Veronica's sister. However, Valentina's situation did not improve under her aunt's guardianship. Instead, her aunt referred to her as a freeloader and a slacker, with no inclination to work or manage the household. Recognizing that Valentina was now of age, her aunt Clavdia assigned her all the household responsibilities, essentially taking over her deceased sister's duties. Clavdia also introduced Valentina to a nearby store where she could borrow alcohol, as it was a place where her friend worked. Aunt Clavdia had developed a fondness for a nightly indulgence of red wine. When funds were scarce, she would hastily make her way to her neighbor's house to procure moonshine instead. Towards the end of each month, they resorted to making bread from the little they had left. However, Clavdia was not the most responsible caretaker when it came to managing money. After settling their debts, both the aunt and her niece found themselves penniless. In her tipsy state, Clavdia would incessantly sing the same song, pressing her niece about when she would find a suitable partner and get married. These remarks often brought tears to Valentina's eyes. Interestingly, Clavdia's friend, Evelina, who sold wine, happened to have a son who owned a shop. Evelina worked diligently in her son's store, and Clavdia saw an opportunity for Valentina to secure a better life through marriage. Clavdia frequently discussed the prospect of Valentina marrying Evelina's son, emphasizing the potential benefits and the comfortable life it would bring. However, Valentina remained silent, unwilling to entertain such thoughts. As she reached adulthood, Clavdia became increasingly persistent, describing the luxurious life she believed Valentina would have with Evelina's son. However, Clavdia's motives were primarily driven by her own well-being, as marrying into the shopkeeper's family would secure her access to the store and potentially free groceries, relieving her of her debts. Despite Clavdia's attempts to persuade her, Valentina resisted, refusing to solve her aunt's financial problems through marriage. Frustrated and pushed to her limits, Valentina finally snapped and declared that she would not be the solution to her aunt's troubles. In a fit of anger, she stormed out of the house, slamming the door behind her. When Valentina eventually returned, she had packed her belongings, including a secret piggy bank that her aunt was unaware of. She had diligently saved one ruble per day since she arrived at her aunt's house, accumulating enough money to pay her own way. Valentina also remembered. Valentina made the decision to take her late father's medals and decorations, as they were the only tangible reminders of him. These precious items became her cherished talisman. With the money she had saved, she was able to afford not only the rent for a modest place to live, but also enough food to sustain herself for the first time. After parting ways with her aunt, Valentina pondered over how she would navigate her life. Attending school seemed out of the question as she needed to cover the expenses of her accommodation and daily living. One day, while at the supermarket, she received a free newspaper that contained advertisements for job vacancies in the city. 
Although there were numerous opportunities, they all required specific qualifications or skills that Valentina, lacking formal education, did not possess. Valentina decided to randomly select a telephone number from the company listings that was seeking a cleaner. It seemed like the only option available to her after school, to mop floors and clean with a rag. She began earning her livelihood through this simple yet honest Valentina work. was swiftly hired by the Human Resources Department due to the particularly toxic environment in the cleaning team at the firm. The office was in a state of filth with three days worth of neglect. As soon as she signed the employment contract, Valentina immediately got to work. Entering one of the rooms filled with computers, she encountered a group of office workers sitting at their desks. Startled by a sharp scream that pierced her ears, Valentina turned to face a strikingly beautiful yet furious girl. This girl exuded a poisonous beauty reminiscent of both heroines and villainesses. With her arched eyebrows, almond-shaped malicious eyes, raven-winged hair, high cheekbones, and sharp chin, she possessed an undeniable allure. Even a single strand of tar black hair at the center of her forehead added to her mystique. One glance at her was enough to understand that she was a beauty with a cruel demeanor. However, despite her venomous aura, the girl appeared to be more than just good looking. She sharply criticized Valentina, pointing out the unpleasant odor emanating from the mop. Can't you see? Can't you feel that the mop reeks? She imperiously demanded, instructing Valentina to quickly rinse it with detergent. As Valentina continued her tasks, she passed by two boys who were whispering to each other, discreetly assessing her appearance and other attributes. Valentina was indeed a pretty girl, but unlike the poisonous beauty who had confronted her, her own beauty exuded a gentleness and softness. Valentina had kind facial features, big gray eyes, a high forehead, and childishly chubby lips. Her blonde, thick hair was casually tied up with a simple terry cloth rubber band. Even in outdated and worn out attire, her thin waist and ample bosom could not be concealed. Timidly, Valentina cast her eyes downward as she held the mop, inadvertently reminding the boys of the unfortunate Cinderella, scolded by one of her wicked stepsisters. They shared these observations in hushed whispers, hoping to avoid catching the attention of the office's self-proclaimed queen, Marianne. It was Marianne who had scolded Valentina earlier, finding fault with her modest attire and shabby shoes. Unbeknownst to the boys, Marianne possessed an exceptional sense of hearing, particularly when it came to overhearing gossip and complaints, a skill she relished in as one of the office's troublemakers. Even before Valentina had left the room, Marianne had already begun discussing every aspect of the young woman's poor wardrobe with her female colleagues. Valentina felt an urge to snap the mop over her knee and tell them all to go to hell, but the memory of her own struggles restrained her. Suppressing her emotions, she rinsed the rubber roller and returned to the office, resuming her task of cleaning the floor while disregarding the taunts from the female staff. Each day spent at work felt like a torturous ordeal. Marianne succeeded in turning not only the employees, but also the bosses against the new cleaner. Only one person showed sympathy towards Valentina, the same guy who had playfully referred to her as Cinderella during their first encounter. One day, he discreetly awaited Valentina near the exit, aware that her workday extended beyond that of the other After employees. patiently waiting, Igor invited Valentina to a cafe where they engaged in cheerful conversation. Valentina found Igor to be open and kind-hearted. However, their pleasant encounter was abruptly interrupted when one of Marianne's friends approached Valentina in a long corridor of the office. You're such a fool, you've gotten involved with someone. Igor is Marianne's boyfriend, the friend warned, emphasizing the potential consequences. If I tell her that you went to the cafe with him, Marianne will make your life a living hell. She's on track to become the head of the department. Just imagine the fun she'll have with you. The next day, as Valentina entered the department where Marianne worked, an unpleasant surprise awaited her. 
Without delay, a song started playing and Marianne, with a serious expression, began interrogating Valentina about where she had acquired her vintage sweatshirt and worn out shoes, cleverly mocking each item in her closet. The other employees, present during this humiliating scene, chuckled politely at Marianne's vicious jokes. Not wanting to engage in a confrontation with the snide and ambitious Marianne, Valentina endured the humiliation silently. Igor, unwilling to risk further involvement, never invited Valentina to the cafe again. If he happened to encounter her in the corridor, he would hastily avert his gaze, unable to look into the eyes of the girl he had liked so much. He felt ashamed and disgusted by his betrayal, having joined in the laughter with the others and witnessed Marianne's cruel performance. Although Igor had long disliked Marian, he did not dare suggest ending their relationship, fearing the repercussions it would bring. Igor found satisfaction in his work at the office. He was an opportunist, eager for career growth, and willing to compromise his genuine feelings and even betray his newfound love to secure a place under the future department head. The salary was satisfactory, and Igor didn't want to jeopardize his chances of success. Marianne, after subjecting Valentina to harassment and public humiliation, appeared as a towering vampire-like figure. As the queen of the office, she reveled in Valentina's humiliation, temporarily leaving the young janitor alone. Valentina's wounded ego clashed with the harsh reality of life. If she quit her job, she risked not receiving her earned wages. Unaware of the contract's terms when she initially signed it, Valentina sought to resign but was informed by Human Resources that leaving before the agreed-upon period or without working for at least a month could result in not receiving any payment. Reluctantly, she realized she had to stay, as the money saved in her piggy bank was nearly depleted. Moreover, Valentina had taken on the responsibility of caring for a little white kitten named Martin, who had mysteriously found his way into the office. She had to protect Martin from Marianne's viciousness throughout the day. Valentina, being a kind-hearted person, couldn't bear to leave the helpless one-month-old kitten on the street and decided to bring him home. The kind old lady in Valentina's building had no objections to having a kitten around. With little money left, Valentina shared her last bit of kefir with Martin. The long-awaited payday coincided with the day the boss was scheduled to visit the office. He held the highest position in the network of branches and businesses and was feared by everyone, except Marianne, who had managed to earn his trust. As the boss made his rounds, he didn't miss the opportunity to visit his beloved's department. Upon seeing the boss, Marianne quickly stood up from her seat and hurried toward him, accidentally knocking her elbow on the armrest of a large computer chair and causing the unfinished coffee in her hand to spill onto the floor. She swiftly concealed the dirty cup under the table with her foot. With a welcoming smile, she approached her boss and greeted him, expressing how they had missed him. Marianne pursed her perfectly contoured lips as if she wanted to kiss the chief, but then cast a vengeful glance at Valya, who was diligently wiping the photocopier with a napkin. She continued speaking, highlighting the office's lack of boredom and how the human resources officer had made a poor choice in hiring the new cleaning lady, who failed to maintain a clean office environment. Guiding the chief with a gentle touch on his arm, Marianne led him to her desk and pointed out the coffee stain left by the spill, angrily indicating Valia. She complained about how the cleaning lady neglected her and left her workplace dusty and dirty. Nikolai Ivanovich, a not-so-old man with an imposing and military-like posture, furrowed his brow. Mariani was well aware that the meticulous chief disliked untidiness, so she saw this as an opportunity to undermine her perceived rival. Summoning Valia to his office, the chief's tone did not bode well. He questioned why the office was in such disarray and why Valia performed her duties so poorly. With a scrutinizing gaze, he observed the embarrassed girl's flushed face. Asterisk, the office was indeed well cleaned. I'm not sure where the stain and dirt came from. 
Valya, the cleaning lady, seems to have a personal dislike for me at the office. Mariani is constantly picking on me, and I suspect she deliberately spilled the coffee to get me in trouble. She wants you to fire me. Valya suddenly became bolder as she addressed her bosses. Nikolay Ivanovich, deep in thought, tapped the table with the cap of his pen. You seem like a good girl. I'm curious why the office workers have such a dislike for you, he pondered. He then asked Valya to introduce herself. Valya shared her name and surname. And when the boss heard her rather uncommon last name, he grew concerned. And your patronymic? What was your father's name, he inquired. Valya lowered her head momentarily, but then proudly raised it. My father's name was Yuri, and he passed away, she replied. Before she could say more, the boss interrupted and continued, in the North Caucasus, he was my friend. The captain died after being mortally wounded, and he saved me by pulling me out of the line of fire. There was a long pause as the boss contemplated, while Valya stood before him, shifting from foot to foot. Breaking the silence, he declared, So, you're saying that Maryashka has been harassing you? We will address this issue. Go back to work, goodbye. Tomorrow, I will arrange for another cleaning lady to be hired. It's not fitting for the daughter of a hero to mop floors. You should focus on going to school, he added. Is your mother still alive? He asked. Valentina shook her head, indicating that her mother had passed away. How long has she been gone? He continued. Valya nodded affirmatively. An orphan then, the boss remarked. Do you have a place to live? Valya shrugged. I used to live with my aunt, and now I rent a room. The chief clenched his fist tightly on the table, his knuckles turning white. We'll figure it out, exclaimed the boss, determined to resolve the situation. That day, Valya hurried back to her rented apartment, her feet barely touching the ground from sheer happiness. She received her first paycheck, along with a generous bonus. Overwhelmed with joy, she dashed to the pet store and purchased cat food for Martin, her beloved feline companion. Spotting a toy for kittens, she couldn't resist buying it. She felt an immense sense of pride in becoming a provider, capable of taking care of both herself and her furry friend. But the most significant source of happiness was that on the same day, the boss took action against the troublesome Maryashka, who had made Valya's life miserable. No longer would she endure humiliation and ridicule over her old, worn-out clothes, as now she had the means to purchase something new. Excited to start anew, Valya set off to shop for clothes. However, the following day brought an even more delightful surprise. When she arrived at the office, she noticed an unfamiliar elderly woman diligently mopping the floors. The HR manager approached her with an unusually flattering and ingratiating demeanor. He handed her a new contract, offering her a position as an operator, working with clients. In the afternoon, the boss arrived and invited Valya to his office. There, he handed her the keys to an apartment. This is the key to my second apartment. I had initially bought it for my future children, but as I have none yet, I want you to live there. It's not right for the daughter of my friend to reside in rented rooms, he explained, his gesture reflecting both his gratitude and concern for her oh, well-being. Oh, I have a kitty. Can I bring him along? Valya asked not willing to go anywhere without Martin. Nikolay chuckled heartily. I don't mind if you bring in an alligator. The apartment has been vacant for a long time, he replied, amused by Valya's request. After gathering her belongings, Valya bid a warm farewell to the kind old lady whose room she had rented. She moved into the spacious two-groom apartment with Martin by her side. The transition brought a newfound sense of joy and comfort to her life. Although officially listed as a simple operator, Valya found herself barely occupied with phone calls at work. The boss treated her like his own child, going above and beyond to provide for her. He bought her new clothes, furnished the apartment she now called home, and even introduced her to various aspects of the company. The childless soldier saw Valya as his potential successor, wishing that if anything were to happen to him, she would be capable of taking on his responsibilities. 
He wanted her to be well-versed in all areas concerning the business, ensuring a smooth transition should the need arise. Valia's presence had become more than just that of an employee. She had become a part of the boss's extended Valia family. Valia had immersed herself in all aspects of work, diligently learning about the office networks and various businesses. However, her aunt Clava always insisted that there was no money for further training. Despite this, a close friend of Valentina's late father urged her to pursue a university education in the economics department. Igor, witnessing the transformation in Valia's appearance and demeanor, as well as the management's favorable treatment of her, mustered the courage to end his relationship with Mariana. He knew that Mariana had long viewed him as lacking potential, so his decision did not inflict much harm. Valia, having experienced the true nature of Igor, rejected his offer to go out on the weekend, knowing his true intentions. Valia declined Igor's advances, both briefly and coldly, realizing how she had been deceived by his cunning and charm. Mariana and Valentina had no use for him anymore, and Valia wondered how she had ever suffered and cried over his betrayal. She couldn't comprehend how she had been infatuated with him, overlooking his true character, merely captivated by his sweet and enticing facade. Reflecting on her past, Valia blamed herself for falling for his deception. One day, while purchasing food for Martin at the pet store, Valia accidentally knocked a jar of pate off the shelf. Before it could hit the ground, a kind and strong hand swiftly caught the jar, preventing it from shattering. Don't skip on cats, they deserve good food, a voice remarked. Take it, the unfamiliar guy said, returning the jar to its place and nodding approvingly at the bag of cat food in Valia's hands. Struck by his dexterity and quick reactions, Valia felt a slight sense of confusion. I love my cat too. He's a savanna, the guy shared, inquiring about Valia's feline companion. I have a purebred Russian backyard cat, Valia jokingly replied. He sneaked into our office, and I rescued him before a mean girl could throw him out the window. That's how Martin ended up with me. Unexpectedly, Valia found herself sharing her story with the guy within minutes of meeting him. They engaged in lively conversation as if they were old acquaintances. Arkip appreciated Valia's humor, and Valentina enjoyed his open-minded perspective on life, which he willingly shared with her. Unnoticed by Valia, Arkip accompanied her back to her house. They stood outside for a long time, engrossed in their conversation, not wanting to part ways. However, the darkness of the night made Valia feel it wasn't proper to develop a deep connection on the first day of their acquaintance. Yet, Arkip seemed to anticipate her thoughts and expressed his reluctance to leave, but acknowledged the need for decency. Together, they bid each other farewell, with the promise As of Valentina more conversations ascended to come. the stairs, she was taken aback by her thoughts, which revolved around impulses and the unity of souls. She had spent the entire sleepless night replaying scenes from the romantic novels she had read, where the characters found their soulmates. In the morning, Valia, still sleep-deprived, prepared for work. However, for the first time in a while, she didn't feel the desire to go. Instead, she yearned to rush to the pet store in search of Arkip. Amidst their conversation, they had forgotten to exchange phone numbers. To her astonishment, as she stepped out of the building, she saw him standing there. You know, I couldn't stay away from you, he confessed. I hurried home to feed my cat and immediately returned to your house. I spent the whole night gazing at your window. He pointed towards her second floor window, the one that emitted light throughout the night. It was fate, you know. Destiny brought us together. You are mine, and I am yours, Arkip declared, drawing Valia closer and inhaling the scent of her hair greedily. Thank you for subscribing and like.